Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Schnorr. I am one of the reproductive endocrinologists here at Coastal Fertility, and I'm excited to be with everybody today. Um, we have set up a Facebook Live to talk a little bit about a very kind of common disorder, which is low egg count, and talk a little bit about what low egg count means, how we can make that diagnosis, what it means for you at different stages, maybe in a person's life. And we'll just talk a little bit about that today. The nice thing about Facebook Live is, is we can be present on your mobile phone and your website and your computer, or whatever you're looking at. So I'm looking forward to kind of meeting with you and doing that. Uh, we have Holly who's with us today who will be taking questions. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to type your questions into the chat box there. And then if it's the right time for the talk, maybe appropriate for the conversation at the time, she's going to bring it up. If at the end we still have unanswered questions, we'll go through all the questions at the end. Uh, and with that, we'll kind of get started. So um, again, my name is Dr. Schnorr, and I'm one of the reproductive endocrinologists here at Coastal Fertility. Coastal Fertility is a practice that was started in 2012. Uh, and since then, we have built to having over 77 employees, as I'll show you along the way. Uh, we haven't had baby parties in a while. I, I'm sure you can imagine why. Uh, this is one of our recent baby parties that we had in 2018. We hope to get back into that soon. We actually had one scheduled for this fall, but the Delta virus kind of became a problem, so we canceled that. Um, but we're going to have baby parties coming up, which just kind of reminds us of why we do what we do. Uh, I really admire a lot of different leaders in the world, and one of the ones that I admire is Walt Disney. Uh, he has a famous quote that said, all of our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. And so often I think we get concerned about the what ifs and maybe it won't work and those types of things. And, you know, I think we do need to pursue our dreams. A lot of patients and people would say, well, you know, that's easy. He was a multimillionaire, but lesser is it known that he actually went bankrupt many times before having success with Disney World. And so I really admire the persistence uh, that comes from just being bold and having courage and kind of moving forward. And that's really what we're about here at Coastal is helping you get from that negative pregnancy test to a consultation, which hopefully helps you start understanding what some of the causes can be. A consultation with us is not any pressure at all to do anything. It's rather just a time to understand and to educate and give you a list of some of the options that you might do to understand the causes and also some of the options that might help you get to where you're going. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in that, you are able to book online at our website, coastalfertilityspecialist.com. You don't even need to call in and talk to a new patient coordinator anymore. All new patient scheduling can be done on, online. Or if you'd prefer to talk to somebody, we have plenty of people to speak with you. We're going to talk a lot about fertility, of course. Uh, the main message being infertility, unfortunately, is very common. Infertility affects about 14% of couples, which is about 28 million couples throughout the United States every year suffer from infertility, very common disorder. It's interesting if you look over an individual woman's lifespan, about 25% of the time in a woman's lifespan when she should be fertile, she's infertile. That might be due to a medical illness, it might be due to stress, it might be due to work problems, it might be due to you know exercising routine, many different things can reproduction um, and sometimes it'll come back to normal once things get back to normal. We all hear about high-tech things that fertility treatment can do. And the truth is the majority of patients conceive with low-tech things. Patients with infertility, frankly, often conceive by just seeing their OBGYN and maybe timing intercourse a little bit differently or maybe changing some of their medications. Sometimes you need to get a specialist involved, which of course is our purpose, uh, and we're here to help if we can help in any way on a woman's fertility problems. And even when you see a reproductive endocrinologist like our group, uh, probably 60% of people People conceive with simpler forms of treatment. Um, fancy stuff is there if we need it, but generally we try with simpler things. I have uh, three wonderful partners. Um, on this screen, you can see Dr. Slowey um, left, and then Dr. Cook is in the middle. I'm kind of in the middle ish, and then that's Dr. McLaughlin on the other side. Um, so we have four wonderful doctors, all board certified reproductive endocrinologists who are really focused on you and helping you. Uh, our team uh, has grown. Uh, we now are the fellowship trained reproductive endocrinology certified in OBGYN and the reproductive endocrinology. And we're proud to serve as the division of reproductive endocrinology for the Medical University of South Carolina. 
Sometimes we have residents with us, and if you come for a visit, hopefully you'll be comfortable with a resident just listening in and learning. That's their chance to learn a little bit about fertility evaluation and treatment so that when they're practicing OBGYNs, they know some of the background as to how to evaluate and treat fertility. Our offices nowadays, we have expanded. Our model and belief is that core high pregnancy rates come from a very good IVF lab, which is a very expensive and time consuming proposition to maintain. So our belief is we have one core lab that provides outstanding pregnancy rates. And then we reach out to you in your local area through some of our regional offices. We now have an office in Somerville I'm going to show you another picture of, which is in the Nexton area. We have an office in Lexington. We have an office in Savannah and an office in Myrtle Beach. Uh, the new office in uh, Nexton is our Somerville office is headed by Dr. McLaughlin, and we have a whole team out there which can provide most of the services that you would need. The focus of today is what do we do? What do you do if your egg count is low? This is a common have and frankly it's a fairly common finding that we find when we do infertility evaluations. We know that women are born with all the eggs they're ever going to have, generally born with about a million eggs in each ovary and then over time uh, there's what we call apoptosis, programmed cell death, kind of die off but also some get ovulated out over time. Egg count is generally measured with ultrasound uh, using transvaginal ultrasound which is an ultrasound probe placed we can count the number of maturing eggs in the ovary and figure out how many eggs are there and how many eggs are kind of in production each month. Normal is probably eight to 10 maturing eggs on each ovary each month in ultrasound. The nice thing about those ultrasounds is they can be done any time of the menstrual cycle. Um, generally probably better to have a reproductive endocrinologist do it just so we're making sure we're counting the maturing eggs. Sometimes the blood vessels can trick you a little bit and look like maybe maturing eggs. And so ultrasound becomes a very accurate uh, tool of understanding egg count. A second way is one called anti-mullerian hormone, which is a blood test that we can do in which we can draw your blood. We know that the maturing eggs make this hormone called AMH. The more eggs you have, the more AMH you have. Uh, it's actually a test that can be done any time of your menstrual cycle. And it's a pretty frequent test done by OBGYNs to kind of screen for your egg count to understand what it is. Um, and the third measure would be FSH levels. FSH is the hormone made, which stimulates your ovary to make eggs. Our brains are smart and have a way of gauging to figure out how many eggs are in your ovary. And if your brain thinks your egg count is low, it tends to elevate your FSH so that your body's compensating for your lower number of eggs. And if we see that your body's compensating, that becomes our signal then that the egg count is low. And so those would be the three ways that we measure egg count. Now, importantly, egg count and egg quality are two totally separate things, and that really needs to be distinguished early on. Uh, egg count is what we can see on ultrasound and what we can measure. Egg quality, that's measured, frankly, probably by a woman's age, that we know as you're, when you're born, your eggs are born with you, you don't replace your eggs, and your eggs get older with time, and as the eggs get older, we know that there's decreased egg quality that's associated with that. We think that's what gives the lower pregnancy rates with fertility treatment as women get older. We think that's the same thing that causes the increased risk of miscarriage as women get older. And we're all aware that there's an increased risk of birth defects as a woman gets older. We think that core is egg quality. Now, you know, patients are always asking me, well, how do we measure my egg quality? And, and the honest answer is, is we look at your birth certificate and figure out your age, right? I mean, that's really probably one of the best measures. Um, there are other ways of looking. Uh, people have, you know, maybe have an experience of doing a prior IVF cycle. And with a prior IVF cycle, maybe sometimes you can visualize low egg quality, or maybe the embryo quality is low. And it's generally thought that embryo quality is probably 90% egg quality and 10% sperm quality. But also there can be a woman's history can do that. So, you know, a history of chemotherapy is generally going to hurt egg quantity and, and likely egg quality. Certainly tobacco use will hurt egg quantity and egg quality. So there might be some lifestyle issues. 
Um, maybe the opposite question is, you know, what in my history would tell you my egg quality is better than my age? And we don't think that's possible. We don't, you know, if you're 37, we don't think there's anything you could have done in your life to make it so your egg quality is really 32. We think your egg quality is your own age or worse, made worse by environmental factors. Um, some people think if they only eat at Whole Foods or if they only eat free range chicken, they're going to have better egg quality. Um, not, the, not the case. Um, so that's kind of how we think about kind of egg number and egg quality. This is a graph that I really like, which shows what anti-mullerian hormones level call that we talked about the hormone made by the eggs in the ovaries is called anti-mullerian hormone. And what we see here is the mean and median anti-mullerian hormone levels from a fertility and Strilly article in 2011. And the trend is kind of what we would expect is that as a woman's age goes up, her anti-mullerian hormone levels gradually go down. Now, you know, sometimes you would see really big changes in hormone levels. Generally, it's a gradual decrease every single day, every single month. If you had an ovary surgically removed, we would see a dramatic drop in AMH level. If you had chemotherapy, you'd see a dramatic drop in AMH levels. For a woman maybe who smoked tobacco, you would see the levels going down faster. So, you know, every day you smoke, the levels are going to just go down further and further. So this kind of is a nomogram that helps us understand if you come in at 33 years of age, age and this right here would show that your median AMH level should be three and if you come in at 33 years of age and your AMH level is one that's how we would say yeah your age your egg count looks lower than your own age would predict now you know patients often ask me well why, why would my egg counts be lower than other women my own age and the answer can be that you could have been born with a low number of eggs and therefore have a low number of eggs at 32 years of age, there could have been some insult to your ovaries. Maybe you were born with a normal number of eggs, ovary removed. Uh, maybe you had a history of tobacco use. Maybe you had chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Those are things that would hurt your egg count. And so sometimes we can tease that out in the history, but absent any real medical reason for that, in most cases, you might be born with a lower number of eggs. And a way you might figure that out is just to talk to family members. You might figure out when mom, you know, went into menopause, the average age of menopause is 52 years of age. And if she went into menopause at 42 years of age, there would be a sign. Maybe there's a genetic correlation that you would want to know about. And, you know, if you were diagnosed with a decreased number of eggs and you had a sister, you would want to tell your sister that she may be at increase for a decreased number of eggs and might be able to help her out a lot through that. So anti-mullerian hormone level becomes a nice tool for that. This is a nice little study that looks at anti-mullerian hormone levels and when menopause will occur. And so what this shows is, is that this is various female ages here. You can see the dash line is the control group that had normal menopause. The solid line is the group of women who had early menopause. And if you had early menopause, you can see that your AMH levels are significantly different than those women who had normal menopausal times. And so, you know, AMH not only predicts egg count, but can predict menopause. And why is that? Well, menopause is when you run out of eggs or have such a low number of eggs you can't reliably ovulate. This is a, this is a study that was published in 2018 in human reproduction uh, and looked at 17,000 people. So a nice big study. And what it showed is, is that with AMH levels, if you have an AMH of 1.5, your risk of going through early menopause has an odds ratio of a 2.6 times increased risk. If your AMH is lower than 1.5 at one, you have a seven and a half fold increased risk and 0 0.5, right, a really low AMH level, a 23 times increased risk for the odds ratio. And so just another kind of way of thinking a little bit about it. Uh, in regards to what do you do if your egg count's low? Well, it depends on where you are in your life. You know, if you've not been trying to conceive at all, your low egg count doesn't necessarily mean you have infertility now. There are a lot of actually nice studies on that, that AMH in and of itself is not a great predictor of infertility. So I would say that if you've not been trying uh, and you have a low AMH, you may not have a problem. Um, so what we would do is um, help to kind of look around. So egg counts can help predict egg counts later in life. So if you have a low AMH now and you're 32 and 
you're thinking about getting pregnant when you're 37, well, that means your egg count's gonna be really lower when you're 37 years of age. So egg counts now can help predict future egg counts and I think can help, as you saw in the earlier study, predict when menopause may happen. If your egg count is low and you're now ready to get pregnant, get started. I think there, again, AMH by itself is probably not a great predictor of current fertility. Uh, depending on your age, I would probably get a basic fertility evaluation. We would be sad for you if you had a low egg count and you decided not to get evaluated and you've been trying to get pregnant then for a year and couldn't get pregnant and found the sperm count was low or a tube was blocked and you kind of wasted your time and knowing how that egg count goes down, that may not be the best option. Certainly if you've been trying for six months to 12 months, then I think it be, might be a very good time to get evaluated. So depending on your you know, anxiety about it and what you want to do about it, you get evaluated right up front or certainly by six to 12 12 months of trying, it'd be reasonable to seek care. What to do if your egg count's low and you're not ready to get pregnant? You know, if this is a bad time to get pregnant, it's a bad time to get pregnant. And so we're, we don't think that you should rush into a pregnancy at the wrong time. And one thing I would recommend you do is what I call improving your environment. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, which means that if you're not trying to get pregnant now and your egg count's low and you're smoking cigarettes, great time to stop. Uh, if you use an electronic uh, cigarettes, great time to stop. Alcohol consumption might pull back on that a little bit. If your weight's a little bit high, it might kind of work on the weight a little bit. Look for other exposures that might be risk factors and see if you can mitigate and moderate those. We have newer technologies of egg freezing where we can take eggs out of your ovary and freeze them now. For example, if you're 32, we can freeze them at 32 years of age. And then you can use them when you're 37 years of age and get a 32-year-old pregnancy rate and a 32-year-old miscarriage risk and a 32-year-old birth defect risk. So egg freezing would be something for you to consider. Um, eggs don't age over time. So once they're frozen, they don't age. Interestingly, your uterus doesn't age over time. When we see these trends of decreased fertility and increased miscarriage rates with age, this is really an egg phenomenon. It does not appear to be a uterine phenomenon and it's not really a sperm phenomenon. As men get older, the sperm count might age a little bit, but not much. Um, and so it helps to kind of keep that egg quality on your side, which is the egg freezing process. Um, we have a team of professionals who specialize in egg freezing. Egg freezing, embryologists do, might have the greatest technician signature, meaning that technically egg freezing needs to be done at certain times with certain medias and moving through the solutions at just the right speed. We are proud members of what we call Donor Egg Bank USA, which is a large company that freezes donor eggs and ships them around the United States. And the reason that matters is that we do a lot of egg freezing. We provide those eggs to Donor Egg Bank USA and those eggs are used in other states within months. And so we quickly get feedback about our egg freezing quality, uh, which a great concern for me if I were the patient would be that somebody freezes my eggs at 32, but they don't do a great job freezing them. When I come in at 37, they don't work uh, because they didn't get frozen well. And so this is a, is a really important issue that is under and not understood well enough by the customers and patients that egg freezing technique matters a lot. Uh, and we've been given multiple awards over the years, including the most recent award last year to Dr. Gray and the team for their pregnancy rates through Donor Egg Bank USA. So we're, we're proud of that. Um, and that's something that is something we could talk more about if you had questions. What to do if you have infertility and a low egg count, which means you've already been trying for six to 12 months and you get evaluated and you're of a low egg count. Well, the low egg count can lower treatment success rates. I'm going to show you what that means. Uh, so we do think egg count matters when you're doing infertility. Sometimes there's adjustments that we can make along the way. I'd say first and foremost, if you have infertility and you have a low egg count, you should complete your infertility evaluation. Make sure there's not blocked tubes. Let's make sure there's not any sperm count issues that make sure everything's as good as it can be. Again, control what you can control. That's where we stop the tobacco and work on the weight reduction and no electronic cigarettes and minimize alcohol and take prenatal vitamins. Uh, there may be some benefits with coenzyme Q10 um, and then um, prenatal vitamins and vitamin D. So you know, that's what I would be thinking about is how do you make things better? Well, you probably can't get back the eggs that you already lost, but you can stop any more damage from occurring. You might 
strengthen some of your eggs there. I do say might. I mean, we don't have a lot of data on coenzyme Q10, but I don't think there's any harm to take in and probably a slight benefit to taking coenzyme Q10. This is an interesting study uh, that is was in human reproduction, and this is a study um, that was published in 2019, which looked at the cumulative live birth rate prognosis based upon the number of exit retrieval. So basically it's saying, what's the chance of a live birth depending on the number of eggs that are retrieved? And what we see in this first graph is, is on the x-axis, you can see some people got zero eggs, which gave them a zero pregnancy rate, and some got as many 35 eggs, so that was really lucky. This is the pregnancy rate here called the cumulative live birth rate, and we can see that the more eggs you get, the higher the pregnancy rate is. Now, the pregnancy rate kind of actually plateaus here. You see this widening, and the reason this widens is the confidence intervals are getting increased because there weren't a lot of people who made 15 or more eggs. So if you don't have a lot of people in this group, your confidence intervals will change. But more than anything, I think we feel that the pregnancy rate starts to flatten out once you get to around 10 to 12 eggs and kind of just stays the same. This is the pregnancy rate with the first embryo transferred in the first cycle. I do want to uh, say that these actual pregnancy rates may not be your pregnancy rates or our center's pregnancy rates. This was a study in Denmark between the years 2002 and 2011. And so while it's slightly older data that was more recently published, the value of it is that it looked at all the babies born from the cycles, so they were able to look at a lot of data. And while the actual pregnancy rate number probably doesn't necessarily apply as much, the trend very much applies that we see that continuing. This is the raw data that is uh, one of the tables, and I really wanted to bring this up to show you that if you look at the different age groups, this is less than 35 years of age, 35 to 40 years of age, and above 40 years of age. You can see that, you know, for example, in the worst group where you only make one to three eggs, in this younger age group, the pregnancy rate was 16.9%. As you got older, the pregnancy rate went down in that same group to 10% and above 45%. As you got more eggs in the younger group and all the groups, as you got more eggs, the pregnancy rate went up. Again, kind of plateaued once you got above 15 eggs. We see that in most of it. The other piece that's interesting out of this data is to look at the difference between the first egg retrieval and the second egg retrieval and the third egg retrieval and the fourth egg retrieval. And this is what is the main message I want to give you today is that persistence matters, right? And so if you're in the worst group, 35 years of age, one to three eggs, your first cycle had a pregnancy rate of 16.9%, persistence pays, your second cycle had a pregnancy rate of 17%, third cycle 16.8, next cycle. What does that mean? It means each cycle, your pregnancy rate still remains about the same. Your pregnancy rate is not going down from cycle to cycle. Doing IVF is not hurting your next cycle's pregnancy rates. We see those same trends that with persistence, even the older age groups, the pregnancy rate remain reasonable and still reasonable to go forward with additional treatment. And so I do think that this is a message that persistence wins. So circling back to, I now have infertility, I have a decreased number of eggs, what do I do? Again, we make sure there's not another diagnosis, we optimize the environment we can, and then we vote on persistence and getting there. And with persistence, we generally have pretty good pregnancy rates with time. So I've seen some of the worst situations of infertility with persistence go away and make actually beautiful babies. So this kind of goes back to Walt Disney earlier on. All of our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. If this is something you're interested in and something you want to pursue, I think by all means go forward and do it with uh, courage and that with persistence we can get to where we're going. Often patients with infertility feel that this is uh, something that should be a natural event and you shouldn't have to go to your doctor and you should be able to do this at home, and we 100% agree with you. Often patients are concerned they're going to say, they find, be concerned that they come to see us and we tell them they can't get pregnant and they'll never be able to get pregnant, and we would never say that. Even the worst case of infertility we have solutions for, whether it might be egg donation or gestation or carrier or donor sperm, we have solutions for all of them. As you heard early on, IVF is not the only option. While I did talk about IVF for decreased egg count because that had a fairly robust amount of data behind it, 
doing simpler forms of treatment like IUI with a lower egg count is a very reasonable thing to do. We should expect lower pregnancy rates. We should expect lower costs, right? They go hand in hand. And then with persistence, you generally would also have a good chance. And I think often patients feel that give, they're giving up or they feel that they need permission to see a physician or subspecialist. And the good news is in America, you don't. Uh, if you wanna see a, a physician or a subspecialist, all you gotta do is go online or call to book that appointment. Remember that CNS is not giving up, it's just uh, gathering facts. When you come in the door, we're not pushing you for anything. We're just here to teach you about what we would do and what our recommendations are and let you decide what's right for you. And by seeing us, you're not giving up. You're just getting others involved. We know that with persistence, pregnancy rates are over 90%. So with persistence, we can get you there no matter what we're dealing with along the way. So um, if you were interested in moving forward, uh, we've developed a very special program, which now has uh, four physicians, five nurse practitioners. We're now up to 18 registered nurses, which have over 136 years of experience. So a very experienced team. Uh, we're proud of the team we've put together. We've got an embryology team with an embryo culture system that we're very impressed with. And uh, pregnancy rates are published nationally and can be seen on our website. And we encourage you to go to the website to review uh, pregnancy rates. Uh, and we've received several national patient satisfaction awards. And this, frankly, is what I'm the most proud of, is, is that patient satisfaction, calling patients back, being kind and compassionate, having a nurture environment, that's what it takes to get to persistence. That's what it takes to get the babies, and I'm very proud of those awards. Um, so we'll, if you were interested, uh, the next step would be for you to schedule a consult so we can discuss options moving forward. A consult generally with us is an hour with one of the reproductive endocrinologists, and we'll go over your history and your testing. And if you've had testing elsewhere, we'd encourage you to bring that with you so that we can review that with you. Often we don't need to repeat tests that have already been done. And then we would get you to a nurse who would spend time with you to kind of go over any of the issues that you, questions you might have, go over the plan that's put forward. And probably the most important part of the consult is the financial consult, where you would hear what your insurance covers, what it doesn't cover. We intentionally do that at the end of the consult because by that time you'll have your plan put together with your physician, at least know what your physician thinks your steps should be moving forward. You can figure out how insurance is gonna handle that. So uh, with that, I wanna thank you guys for taking time out of your busy Tuesdays. Uh, Facebook Live seems to be a good opportunity for doing that. I wanted to pause there to see if you had any questions. And the good news is I think this will be available in a video format on Facebook. So if you wanted to rewatch this in the future or maybe get your partner to watch that, we can. So I am gonna stop there and uh, look over to Holly to see what we have for questions. So Melissa wants to know, what do you think of mini IVF right. or DOR? Right. So um, Melissa is asking about mini IVF, and, and there's there's a lot of different terms for mini IVF. But often, what mini IVF means is a minimum dose of medication. So it's a lower dose of medicine, and generally with that, we expect a lower number of eggs. And you just saw that graph looking at egg count. So uh, that graph, you know, the the paper that I showed you earlier actually kind of matters a little bit in that regard. We don't think that all eggs are normal. As a matter of fact, most of the studies show that the majority of ovulated eggs even in young women are abnormal. And the beauty of IVF is, is that with a full dose stimulation, you can get a year's worth of eggs and make a year's worth of embryos and then sort through that year's worth of embryos to put the best embryo one, one at a time into the uterus. Generally, minimal dose IVF stimulations save you money, but result in a dramatically lower pregnancy rate and that makes it so it's not as cost effective. So while the price seems like it's great, if you compare the price to the pregnancy rate, you'll probably find out it's not as great of a deal as you might have hoped it was. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. And again, I've enjoyed being part of this. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to you know, call and schedule a consult. And we look forward to talking with you guys then. So take care. Bye-bye.